All right, so uh, brothers and sisters, let's, uh, let's do some business with God and get into his word and continue in worship. Uh, Father, um, we do come before you, and um, God, we know uh, according to your word uh, that we have been uh, saved. Um, you have, your work is sufficient. The work that your son did on the cross was complete. Um, it was a finished work. And uh, we, re- we have received that salvation, uh, and it's by grace through faith that we have received that. And uh, it's, it's the work that you did, your righteous work. And uh, so based on that, uh, we are saved because of what you've done, not because what we do or have done, uh, but uh, the work that you did. Um, accomplish salvation and based off that and uh, the promise in 1st John 1 9 that if we confess our sin that it is you who is faithful and just Uh, and so uh, let's take a few seconds uh, uh, to to trust our faithful and just God to forgive us our our sin and all of our unrighteousness Uh, so just if uh, there's anything you need to confess before the Lord take a few um, minutes here to do that Again, Father, uh, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, we adore you, and uh, we just sang of, of, uh, of the work that you've done, Lord, of uh, your faithfulness and um, of who you are. Your attributes, Lord, is, is uh, what we uh, need to uh, be focused on uh, as we worship and adore you. And, um, and God, we do just give you thanks um, that you've equipped us. Um, and thank you for your word uh, that you've given us um, direction um, and that you've given us the, in the, the ways that we should and ought uh, to live. And it is just simply, uh, as Paul says, it's, it's reasonable. In light of all that you've done for us, it is reasonable that we seek to be sanctified uh, by your word, and um, Lord, you've given us all. Um, Lord, may we just learn how to walk according to the Spirit and uh, not present ourselves to the sin nature. And so we thank you and and, uh, praise you uh, for all the wonderful works you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Romans 1. And Romans 1. Verse 11 is where we're going to uh, start, uh, but before we start there, we're going to do just a little bit of recap of last week. So here's where we're at. Uh, we started talking about the purpose or the occasion of why Paul is writing to uh, the church in Rome, and that's covered in verses 8 through 15. Uh, so last week we, we made it uh, to chapter, or excuse me, to verse 11, um, and we, we, we began last week with, with what Paul's, Paul makes priority. He says, first, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. And in Texas, this would be y'all. So first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. The primary item of business, we said, is that Paul wanted to address in his letter was to the saints in Rome. He was giving thanks to God for those saints. And then we, we took a look at, at Thanksgiving. This an acronym is all it is, and it's, it's just simply a way to remember in our prayers and our giving of thanks to the Lord of, of how it is that we um, uh, approach God, and the first here is the A, adoration. So again, we adore God. We're reminded of who he is. We're reminded by his word of, of all that he has accomplished and uh, of his faithfulness, and we love simply because he first loved us. Not that, it's not that I loved and sought after God, but God sought after us. He loved us first, even while we were at, at war, at enmity with God. God loved us, and he demonstrated his love in that he sent his son, his one and only son, 
the eternal Son, the God-man, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on the cross for remission of sin, that we may, according to the word of God and according to that righteous work, we may be born again. We may be reconciled to God. And so we adore God in light of that. And then as we are, are, are children of God now, as we have been transferred from Adam into Christ Jesus, we have a familial, or we're in the family of God, as we sang earlier, and now we confess our sin when the Holy Spirit brings it to our attention. We, we understand God doesn't leave us in that spot as, as, as just being saved, but he wants us to grow up. He wants us to grow in the grace and knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. And so, so we, we then confess our sin, and this is a privilege to be able to confess our sin to our Father so that we can be restored then, as we just said, to fellowship. Because sin still breaks our fellowship with God. It breaks our fellowship with one another. Because now I'm, I'm, I'm chasing after, I'm presenting myself to the sin nature as opposed to presenting myself to God to be used for his righteous work. And so if we, the children of God, confess our sins, again, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, not from some, not from part, not from most, all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. So then we thank God, praise God. Again, thank you for your faithfulness, for your righteousness. And then as we end our prayers, we we bring to God those requests, our supplication. We intercede for our brothers and sisters. We pray for one another. And we pray as Paul prayed, with thanksgiving. You know, it's not, a, it's not an emphasis on praying to, I want my brother to change, so I'm gonna bring them before God. It's not that. It's, it's that, change me, God. Bless my brothers. Bless your children, because all of y'all are God's people and I'm, I'm simply here to serve you by bringing you the word, and that's it, and that's it. And, and so when we bring our brothers and sisters then t- before Christ, that's when, that's when God not only works in and through those prayers, but he, 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 works, in, he works in us, and things are brought to our mind and to our attention. Oh, this is, thank you, God, this is a way that I can bless them. This is a way that I might uh, bring encouragement to them, that I might edify them. And, and so that's, that's, um, that's the anachronym that we went through last week. And this is just a snapshot of, of uh, I wanted to throw this up just to kind of get a reference to the succession of Paul's letters by year. So we're here, get this thing to, we're here, 57 AD. This is where Paul writes his letter to the Romans. And again, um, we'll talk a bit, a a little bit about Philippians today, which was written between 60 and 62 AD. Um, And so when we, when we make reference to that, that's, you know, roughly three to five years later. Um, But in in 57 AD, Paul is writing this letter to the Romans. And remember, he's, he's trying to get there. And uh, he's trying to find it in the will of God that he would, that he would come to Rome and uh, share Share with them, it says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. And this is, this is where we're starting today. He says, and Paul's longing was to meet physically with the beloved saints of God in Rome to officially establish the local church according, according to his apostolic gifting and authority. Paul's not suggesting in verse 11, that he is the giver of gifts. Let's make that clear. Or that he is going to administer some random spiritual gift, such as gift of apostle, prophet, evangelist, or pastor, teacher. Paul is simply seeking to build on a foundation here that has already been laid by, by Christ. Because remember, none of the, the, uh, there is no credit, there's no historical evidence. We talked about that last week. There's no uh, evidence that there was ever an apostle or, or anybody that had gone to Rome. Rather, the consensus is most likely these were Jews 
that had received Jesus as Messiah on the day of Pentecost, and they were in their journeys now, tr they had traveled back to Rome and, Rome, and so they are sharing the gospel in Rome, and what's happening are Gentiles are getting saved in Rome. And so, so there's a mix in this, in this area and, uh, of, of, of Jews, you know, probably brought it, and, and then the, uh, the Gentile is starting to receive it. And so, so, so again, Paul's just simply wanting to, 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 to build there what's already st started, because we did see that Paul said, you know, there was an etiquette that if, if, if there was already an established uh, apostle in a certain area, Paul didn't go there. He, he went somewhere else. And that was so that they were efficient in spreading the gospel. Uh, but also, so, okay, Peter's got this, you know, uh, uh, you know, all the other apostles have this area. Paul says, I'm going to go where there's not another apostle that has been. So, uh, so Christ had already gifted every saint in Rome, uh, bringing us back. Um, every saint in Rome with spiritual gifts. The moment they believed the gospel. So the moment they believed the gospel is when they received their spiritual gifts. Paul, again, is wanting to encourage and strengthen their faith. Furthermore, God's word tells us that Jesus gifted the apostles to the early church so that it would have a solid foundation. Ephesians uh, uh, 2.20, Ephesians 2.20 tells us that the early church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Remember, Christ proclaimed in Matthew 16, 18 that I will build my church. This is Christ's church that he is building. And he is building it upon the apostles and prophets. So Jesus Christ then himself being the chief cornerstone is building his church. And please, please, please remember it's the giver of gifts that is to receive glory and honor, not the vessel presenting the gift. Paul makes it clear in Ephesians 4, 7 who that giver of gifts is. He claims, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. It's Christ's gift. Jesus Christ, again, the chief cornerstone is the giver of gifts. He is able to give spiritual gifts because they belong to him, and therefore, they are his to give. So what are the gifts uh, that Christ gives on that note? Verse 11 explains, if we go on, and he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And why was it? then why did Christ Jesus graciously give all such wonderful gifts? So verses 12 through 13 tell us, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Our unity is of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is why God gifted the church with the, with the, the apostles, the prophets, pastor, teachers. So Paul then was not enabling the saints in Rome to use or exercise their individual spiritual gifts. Rather, he was simply imparting his own spiritual maturity regarding the grace of God to the saints in Rome for their equipping, for their edifying, to be established to continue the work of ministry so that their faith would be unified and the body of Christ, the church, would glorify the head Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is, this is the church. This is what, and this is what Paul is wanting to encourage here in Rome. 
Again, the, so the body of Christ, the church, would glorify the head, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to glory, to the glory of God alone. So may we as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ learn how to share with one another the grace of God and how it has impacted our individual lives so that we may have true fellowship with one another. This is my prayer for our local assembly, so that the grace works of God might be glorified. So that the grace works of God might be glorified. May we all begin to be disciplined by grace. We have received grace for our justification. We walk in grace according to our sanctification. It's the grace of God, it's the goodness of God again that draws man to repentance. And we looked at that term repentance, metanoeo, changing of the mind. The goodness of God changes our mind, mainly about who he is and his good works. So then, Paul also states later on in Romans 15, 29, he says, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Paul is claiming that when he meets the saints in Rome face to face, the blessing of the gospel of Christ will be made full. That when the measure of Paul's faith and the measure of the saints in Rome, when their faith come together, there should be an establishment. The body of Christ being faceted together to make up one building. Also in Rome, Romans 16, 25 through 26, Paul speaks about a mystery that has been made manifest. And it was, a, it was unique to the good news that God revealed first to Paul. So this is one thing that Paul is wanting to share and how he's wanting to bless. So there's this mystery. He says, in Romans 16, 25 through 26. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest. According to my gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery the secret now made manifest. So, there are many mysteries in the, in the Bible, that, uh, many mysteries that are revealed at various times and in various ways, but what is the mystery that was made manifest expressly to Paul? Well, first things first, let's make sure, and this is where we need to pay a little bit of attention. These, we're going to start into your questions here. That, uh, um, if, you don't, if you don't have them, if you want some after church, get with me and I'll, I'll print some off with you. Uh, maybe grab a pen. I think there's some pens back on the table uh, if you want to take notes. Um, but let's, let's clearly observe how Paul is using the word mystery in this passage. Again, we're looking at uh, Romans 16 here. What Paul is not saying, let's get this out first. What he's not saying is that the mystery is the gospel and the gospel is difficult to understand. He's not saying that in this passage. Uh, he's not, he's, what's difficult, you know, again, what is difficult to understand about good news? Because that's essentially what the gospel is, right? It's, it's good news. It's good news, as we have established, from God to man. So what's difficult to understand about good news? So if you look the word mystery up in a Greek lexicon, you will find the word mystery simply defined as secret plans of God. The secret plans of God. So, so this is kind of our basis of our understanding here. The biblical definition is in Ephesians 3, 9. And Paul says, that which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. So when Paul is talking about a mystery, it is something that has been hidden in God 
uh, from the beginning of the ages. So, as to how the term mystery relates to the gospel, that which is hidden can be further dist distinguished in one of three ways. The first sense is that the concept of the gospel was written about in scripture, but the full content remained completely hidden apart from divine illumination. So previously written about, but not understood. In other words, without the Holy Spirit illuminating the scriptures, the individual could not understand this, this uh, aspect of God's salvation. The content of the gospel remained veiled then. This content of the gospel remained veiled in God, namely regarding who the Savior is. A good example of how the word mystery is used in this sense is in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 8. Paul is explaining here how Jesus Christ's identity remained veiled to those who called to, to those who he called the rulers of this age, Paul explains, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. So this sense then, when Paul was alive, when Paul was sharing the gospel, and, and prior to that when uh, when these, the Jews especially, they missed their Messiah. They did not receive Jesus as Messiah. So this is the mystery that Paul is, is talking about. They simply, they simply did not receive their Messiah because there was, there was, they just lacked understanding. It was written about, but they were still looking for, as we talked about earlier, Shiloh. They're still looking for their Messiah to be king. They're still looking for, and Jesus came and presented himself, and they said, no, again, we want political reform. That's what we want. We want to be saved from the Roman Empire. We want Israel to be on top, and we want to rule. That was the Pharisaic uh, perspective. That was the, the Judaizers. They wanted to rule. They didn't want to give up their power. They wanted to rule. So, so then what Paul is saying is that when the gospel message of Jesus Christ and him crucified was being proclaimed according to the scripture, the mystery of Messiah's identity was being uh, uh, was being veiled in the mystery. But once the promise of the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, the church was born. The believer was then permanently indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Subsequently, God began to use believers to reveal his son's identity as Savior as they began to explain from the scriptures the cross work of Jesus Christ and, and how he was the fulfillment of of the prophesied Messiah. So Paul, day after day, we studied this in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15, that day after day he went into the synagogue explaining to them from the scripture who the Messiah was. Sabbath after Sabbath, Sabbath after, after Sabbath, and then they received and they believed. So it, it, took, it took time and it took uh, them to be willing but mainly it was through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So, so God began to use believers to reveal his son's identity as savior. And then likewise, when we share the gospel, when you and I share the gospel message with someone that is lost, we are simply bearing light as witnesses to the crucified Christ. And, and according to Paul, speaking the wisdom of God to those who, not, who do not know Jesus as Messiah, as Messiah. So this is what happens when you and I share the, the good news message with someone, is that the Holy Spirit can work in and through when we, when we have a good, solid uh, basis of the gospel message uh, according to the scripture, and we share that with, with others, then the Holy Spirit 
convicts them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And, and then through that, he illuminates, and it's he that saves. We just bear light. We're just, we're just witnesses. So this, that's one sense of the word mystery, is that it was hidden and that previously written about but not understood. The second sense of the mystery of the gospel is that the written concept is understood. So we understand the general concept, but as to how and when it's going to happen and who is going to accomplish the work remains hidden. Simply put, all the details of the message have not been fully disclosed. We only know that it is going to happen. If we go back again to Genesis 3.15, we can see how the pro, what we referred to before, that fancy term, that, that proto meaning first, evangelium meaning gospel. So the first gospel, the mention of the first gospel is, is, to, is in this sense a mystery. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here we read God's promised seed from the woman whose heel will be bruised by the serpent, but ultimately the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. So this is the pure gospel that there's going to be one that will kill the serpent. That's simply this message. That's, that's the basis of the gospel here, that salvation is going to happen. God is going to send this one through the seed of the woman, and he's going to bruise the head of the enemy. He's going to defeat Satan. This is, the, this is the basis of the gospel message. There is nothing in this passage of Scripture that reveals how and when this is going to happen, nor is there any indication as to who the woman's seed is going to be. And remember, this is what they had. This was the gospel. This is where their faith was. So their faith was in this. There's a promised seed. Simply that. So that, that was the gospel message that Adam and Eve received and that they believed and they passed on to the first brothers who interestingly we don't have enough time to get into that story, but, but you know, there, were, there, was a, there was atonement that was made for this, too, that God did. He, God drew first blood. God took the skin of an animal, an innocent animal, and covered them. Adam and Eve received it through faith. The fig leaves weren't good enough. Our self-righteous works aren't good enough. We received the good work of God, and that was, that was, Again, that's what they received, and that was where their faith. It's always been by faith. And this is the gospel message, is that the good works of God are sufficient to save you, simply. And as we go throughout history, this progresses. You'll see it progress in, in, in Abraham. Abraham is given more information. He's given more information about the gospel. And then through the prophets, there's more details about, about how and how. And, and, and directing towards who and when this promised Messiah is going to come. So, so these are all things then, uh, this is how the mystery then is referred to in this sense, is that the basis is there, but there is, there is um, it's, it's hidden because only the basis was made known. So, And again, may I point out, n none of this, what we've looked at before, the gospel of salvation, the person, Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the son of God and the son of man, Jesus Christ, the God-man, his work was that he died on the cross, he shed his blood for remission of sin, he was buried, he rose bodily from the dead, and that work accomplished our sin debt's penalty. That's what we believe. That's what we receive. And it was in full. And it was complete. And it is finished. 
We do not build on that work. That work was simply completed by God and given to us as a free grace gift. So the third sense, the third sense of how the term mystery relates to the gospel is that certain aspects of it were not written about at all. In other words, we have the gospel message. We know that there's a promised seed. We know that there's going to be a savior. We know how he's coming now. But there are things that are going to happen also, a part of that work, certain things that are going to happen that are not written about at all. And so this is what Paul is talking about. He says, um, again, the truth of the gospel message has been written about, but the truth of it, it, the message is not clearly understood. However, certain aspects um, were never written about prior to the revelation of the church pertaining to the gospel. Namely, the eternal effects of the gospel and all its accomplishments. So if we take a look at this, turn with me please to Ephesians 3, 3 through 10. I can't fit all this on a, on a slide, sorry. Um, so again, Ephesians, Ephesians 3, three through 10. So Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. He says here, and he's explaining the revelation of this mystery that we're talking about. He says, how that, how? By, by revelation, he made known to me the mystery. By revelation, God made known to Paul the mystery. As I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, that's prior to the church age, was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And what is that mystery? that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, through the good news. This is good news. Of which I, Paul, became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. And again, what is all this? Why? To me, who am less than the least of all the saints. Again, remember Paul saying here, I am the, the, I'm less than the least of all the saints. This grace, he understands grace, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. This is so God's work, righteous work, can be made known. That's why, that's why the Jew and Gentile have been joined together, so that the body, the body of Christ, the church, in this church age, can bring glory to God's work. So when we trace the gospel message then through the Bible from Genesis uh, to the birth of the church, we can clearly see that the revelation of the content of the message is in fact progressive. What is understood about the content of the gospel message in the church age was hidden in God, as Paul claims, from the beginning of the ages. So now that we have a bit more clarity on the term mystery, let's revisit the original question. So, so what was the mystery related to the gospel that was made manifest expressly to Paul? Uh, or simply, what was it about Paul's gospel that was hidden? Well, we just talked about the first mystery revealed exclusive, exclusively to Paul, that both Jew and Gentile have been reconciled into one body. 
the body of Christ, which is the church. If you will, please turn back with me in your Bibles to Ephesians uh, 2. So you might have to turn a page, or it might just be up there uh, from you. 2, chapter 2, verse 11. So Paul says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, at what time? Prior to the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. So at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, wow, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, and how are we, let me ask you this, how are we in Christ Jesus? By the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that happens the moment you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near. And how have we been brought near? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both Jew and Gentile one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that, and what is the enmity? That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. The law of commandments was the enmity between Jew and Gentile. He's broken it down in the flesh so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, again, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near to both those who were far off Gentile and those who were near, near Jew. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you, all y'all, are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, the Jews, and members of the household of God. That's the mystery that Paul is talking about. Now, let me ask you this. In what sense is Paul using the word mystery? So let's take a look back here. Actually, let's go back here. So, in what sense? So, so was, this, was this mystery, let me just ask you this simple question. Was this mystery formally written about? The, about the Jew and Gentile being brought together? Anybody? Nope. I say a head shaking. Nope. Nope. Oh, so he is talking about it's hidden because nothing was written. This is an aspect of the gospel nobody knew. Wow. So, so again, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since since the world began. There it is, but now made manifest. So is, again, is there anything written in the Old or New Testament prior to the birth of the church regarding both Jew and Gentile being reconciled to God in one body? No. So again, it's, it's number three, and he says this, the reconc or. That, that Paul is using this word mystery in this uh, passage in this sense is that the reconciliation of both Jew and Gentiles into one body was a mystery until God himself unveiled the mystery to Paul. Paul is saying, again, nobody saw that coming. 
wasn't even written about. So the second mystery revealed solely to the Apostle Paul is that of positional truth. And again, we just read in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 2 that both Gentile, Jew and Gentile are found how? In Christ Jesus. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, so again, this positional truth, we've already, we've already talked about a bit, uh, but, but Paul proclaims to us in Colossians 3.3, 3, he says that for, for you died, you died. That's a fact. When you believed, you died. You died with Christ, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's the positional truth. Having also been resurrected with him then, so, so the position or identity of the church age believer is no longer in Adam, but rather in Christ. You have been identified with the God-man, Christ Jesus. This is your eternal identity according to the scripture, which is the infallible word of God. If we have an issue with this, we need to pray and ask the Lord to give us insight because we're having an authoritative issue with his word. We are in fact, as believers, in Christ. Paul will go on, he, he'll go on into this, uh, go into this in greater detail as we dig further into the book of Romans. But, but here's just simply a sneak peek of what's to come. All those verses, all these verses are only the imperative mood of the verb. So there's an indicative mood. So the, all these, chapter 3, 6, 7, 10, 11, all these chapters all refer to our positional truth, this fact as being in Christ Jesus, our new identity. You know, it's no wonder the world has an identity crisis today because the church of God, we're not being taught this. We're not being taught that our identity is in fact in Christ. We're not being, we're not being taught this. I wasn't. You know, until a, a, a man of God, you know, pointed it out, and then you're like, whoa, it's right there. We, we are, in fact, in Christ as believers, and that's what God's Word says. That's our identity, because when God sees us, He sees the righteousness, the imputed righteousness of Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me, and that's the mystery. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. We are faceted together as the church. So again, this is what Paul is wanting to bring to, uh, to those who are in Rome. He's wanting to share with them these mysteries, the mystery of positional truth, the, the mystery that the Jew and Gentile are now one. He's wanting to share all these things with them. And most importantly, he's saying, I as an apostle can bring this grace and knowledge of God to you, and you can bring a grace and knowledge to me, and as we come together, as we assemble, as, as the ecclesia, as the church, as we unite together in faith then, God is magnified, God is glorified, and His work then is, is made, is emphasized, so if you're following along in your Bibles, so that, that's the mystery that Paul is talking about there. Turn back with me to Romans 1.12. Go back to Romans 1.12. So he says, and just back up to verse 11 real quick, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. And that is that I may be f encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So here it is. Not only was Paul longing to establish the church at Rome in their faith, but he was also seeking encouragement 
he himself was also seeking encouragement in the fellowship of their faith. Paul understood the importance of the body of Christ and how our mutual faith builds each other up. Again, it's, there's a mutual faith growth that happens when the body of Christ assemble together and glorify God. This special time where we, where we worship God not only in song but in, in sharing the word with one another and, and sharing the truth of God with one another, our faith then is built up. And so the author of Hebrews encourages us in this way. He says, let us, that's the, that's the church, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more, so much more, so much the more as you see the day approaching. And what day is that? That's when Christ is going to snatch his church. As that day approaches, we need to be assembling together as we've just witnessed a, a massive paradigm shift in how quickly the church's religious right can be taken away. Forsake not the assembling together as some. That's a command from God. So when the government comes, that's something, again, respectfully. Respectfully, we are to honor our government because God establishes our government. We may not like them, we may not agree with them, but God has put them in order for a reason, just like Nebuchadnezzar was in order. And, and, and Daniel still served him. But we honor God. We live a quiet and peaceful life. And by being those witnesses of Christ to our persons in leadership, that then is how we ought to live. But what happens when, when, when the government says, you cannot assemble, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to enter into civil disobedience as graciously as I can. We cannot forsake the assembling. This is a command from God. So we, we, we assemble. We, we pray, just like Daniel was told not to pray, and he entered into civil, but he did it. He did it in a manner in which was respectful. And it's not out of, it's not out of an aggressive response. It's not out of rebellion, because that's not what we're here for. We're here, we are ministers of reconciliation. This is what's been given to us freely. We, we reconcile. We have the gift of reconciliation. That's the gift that has been given to the whole church. And it's through the gospel. We reconcile again by sharing the good works of God and how we can be reconciled to God. So then... So he says in 13, he says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. In other words, I don't, I don't want you to think otherwise. Because uh, that I've often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So what was it that hindered Paul? So if we turn, again, Romans, I know we're doing a lot of flipping today, Romans 15, and take a look there at verses 18, Romans 15, 18 through 23. <clears throat> so why was Paul hindered? Well, Paul says, for I will not dare to to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed, 
to make the Gentiles obedient. Again, this is what we were talking about earlier. In mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to um, Elikram, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Uh, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, again, what we mentioned earlier, not where another apostle has been, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Remember, the apostles were given for the foundation of the church. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. For this reason... I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts, Paul's already shared the gospel, uh, uh, ha and having a great, de great desire these many years to come to you, when he says, if we go on, he says, when I, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. So in other words, and he goes on to say that I I'm going to Jerusalem uh, to minister to the saints and then he talks about a couple more places, but he's getting ready to make his way to Rome. I've already preached the gospel pretty much. There's, I've, I've, I've done my part here. I've covered my territory, and I was hindered until this point because of this, because I still had places here that I had to share this gospel message. So now, you know, at that time, uh, he's going to come. And again, God's timing is perfect. God is working out in Paul his perfect patience. Remember, that it is Paul who would write to the Philippians some, as we pointed out earlier, three to five years later, that we are to be, what? Anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul was at peace. He was saying... These, these things I must do until I can make it to you. And, and Paul is, is learning this, you know, as, as he's writing, you know, this is three to five years after this that he's writing that. So he's, he's grown at this point even a little bit. So we see a little bit of, of growth in Paul, Paul because you can see he's saying, look, I'm, I'm praying to God all the time that I can get to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being persistent, but, but again, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Paul lived what he preached. He didn't just give lip service. This was Paul saying, you know, this, I have this desire. I have this longing. I know it's from God. God told me I was going to go there. But be anxious for nothing. Prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. You know, this, this, this is the example. This is how we ought to live. Again, there's no, just to remind us that there's no evidence of, of, of the advancement of, of the gospel message in Rome. And, and none of the apostles had even traveled to Rome at this time in 57 AD. Uh, and we mentioned earlier that the, the consensus is that the gospel message made its way to Rome by traveling Jews, he had received Jesus as Messiah elsewhere in their journeys. So, when these Messianic believers brought with them the gospel message and shared it with the Gentiles, many began to believe. And furthermore, um, you know, Paul made it his aim, it was his aim to preach the gospel. And he was going to preach the gospel wherever he could, but there was a strategy. He didn't want to build, he said, on, an, on, on one of the other apostles' foundations. So, but what he's doing at Rome, there's no apostle there. There's no one there at that time. And God had already promised him that he was going to be, bear witness of him in Rome. You're going to bring my gospel message to these believers in Rome. And what was it for, again? Why would Paul preach the gospel message to those who are saved? Why would Paul preach the gospel message to those who are already saved? The gospel message is not just for our, our justification. It's not just to be saved from sin's penalty. 
but the gospel message, the good news, it is the power of God unto full salvation. It's the power of God to sanctification for our growth. It's not that we we save and then we do. It's, it, uh, it's that we get saved and then we do. It's that we get saved and our faith grows. We grow in the grace and knowledge of God. We grow then by it, it's, it's the faith. And how does our faith come? What's the word say? Faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. It's faith in the word of God. That's how we grow. Because, and, and again, I'm going to say this over and over because we, we got to get this. Jesus prayed to the Father, what? Sanctify them by thy what? Truth. Why? Because thy word is truth. This is, this is the truth in by which we grow. This is how we grow in our faith. And again, it emphasizes, what does the Bible emphasize? The good, the good, the good, the good, the very good works of God all the way back to Genesis. All of God's works have been good from the beginning. And he has freely given them to us from the beginning. That's how we respond. That's where we place our faith. Because if we, if we continue again, if we continue in this pattern of, 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 of emphasizing over and over and over again a works-based salvation, we, according to Paul, are preaching a false gospel in Galatians. Actually, turn with me in closing to, Gal to Galatians. Which, by the way, Eight of 13 of Paul's letters, eight of 13 of Paul's le letters all begin in the pattern that we've seen and with thanksgiving. There's none in Galatians. None. He doesn't give thanks here. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's make it clear, Paul says. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself. Who gave himself. Who's the giver of gifts? And who gave he gave, who gave himself for what? Our sins, that he might deliver us. Who delivers us? He might deliver us from this present evil age. And what was it according to? To the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is how God get, gets glory. And he doesn't give thanks. He says, I marvel, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And this term different, it's not, it's not oh, this is slightly different. It's Paul saying there is one good news message. It originates from God. It comes to man, and that's it. To a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul is hot. Talk about hot. He is, he is on fire. But even if we, apostles, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema. The anathema of God be upon you. If you preach any other gospel than what I just brought to you, if you preach anything other than this, may your ministry be cursed by God. That's what Paul's saying. That's not a giving of thanks. And why is it? It's against the core. It's against the foundation. It's not bringing glory and honor to God. They were telling them, okay, you can be saved, but you've got to do this. You've got to be cut. And that was a specific 
you know, interpretation, what's going on here is that the Judaizers were coming in and saying, no, you, st you still have to be circumcised. But, but here's the thing. If we put our fingernail, if we put anything and add that to the gospel that we have to do to be saved, it is another gospel. It is not a gospel at all. It's not the gospel of Christ. It's, we've turned it into a gospel of works. We've turned it into something that I earned, I gave, I prayed, I walked, I bowed, I said this, I did this. Who's the spotlight on? Me. God gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is God's gospel. It comes from him, and it comes to us, and it comes freely, and we receive it through faith. And it's by the grace of God we have been saved, not of works. If it is, I can boast. And the moment that I can say it's from me, guess what? It's not grace. It's no longer grace. I've earned it. I earned it. How audacious is that? Father God, uh, oh, we, we are so gracious, so gracious, God. We're so thankful, um, Lord, that your, your message belongs to you. Uh, we, we tend to mess things up. And I, Lord, I just pray uh, that we, the church, uh, would learn um, how to get together and share in this common faith, the faith in your works, not our own, but the faith in your gospel message. The fact that you saved God, that you gave, you did all these things again and again. You told Israel, I saved you from Egypt. I did these things. I told you, you can only take 300 because if you take more, you will get the glory. God, this, even our salvation, is to bring honor and glory to you. That's the purpose. That's our fellowship. We are in you. Lord, help us, God. Again, we, you've given us everything. You've given us your word. Just change our minds. Change every pastor, teacher, Lord. Change their mind and, and cause them to see the false gospel message that they're preaching if it's based on works. All of Israel proved that they couldn't keep your law and that law was given to them as Paul says. And so God help us again to, to, um, to just rejoice um, and Lord we, we live according to the law of the Spirit and, and uh, God that's in, that's in grace and um, of course it's all you. Um, from the beginning to the end, you, you who began this good work in us will be faithful to complete it. And uh, Lord, we look forward uh, to that day when you do complete it, God. That's our hope. Um, and uh, just, just pray over your people here today, God, that they would just see your goodness, that they would see the promise in your word for them, um, that we would begin to grasp these things, Lord, all these mysteries, Lord, that weren't even written about in your word, but, but are, are a um, result in salvation and just wonderful works that you did, God. And uh, so as we continue to worship you in song, Lord, may we respond to you um, to this truth in praise and adoration. And again, thank you for everyone here. And if, it, if anybody here has any question about the gospel, uh, I pray that they would, um, that they would ask. Um, and, um, and Lord, we do pray for, for minds to be changed and for uh, just encouragement as we, uh, when we do leave uh, and uh, as we go out into our ministries into the world outside of this uh, assembling together. 
And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.